Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Ignacio Grossman. I'm from the Center for Advanced Process Decision Making at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, today I'd like to give you an overview of the work that we've done in the system Pyosome, which is an advanced tool for process uh, synthesis. Again, I apologize for the fact that I cannot be alive, uh, you know, live with you, but at least I uh, hope that the presentation here will still be useful to, to all of you, okay? So basically here, let me start here first by sharing my screen. And essentially what uh, we want to do here, let me see if this uh, comes up. Yeah, there we go. And essentially here again, I want to describe Myosin, which are advanced computational tools for advanced process synthesis. This is actually the result of PhD work of my student Shi Chen, who actually created about uh, one year ago. And essentially here, the uh, thing, first thing I wanted to mention is the fact that I'm supplying here bibliography that uh, should be hopefully useful to you. Uh, the last paper is the one that specifically uh, describes the system Pyosin, which actually impressed, so to speak, in computer and chemical engineering, which should, should be out in a minute. And all the other papers uh, give basic background on uh, both uh, process synthesis, general ideas on uh, disjunctive programming and application for modular process synthesis and cable uh, common. So again, I hope that these um, uh, uh, papers uh, prove useful to you, and I think that would be a good complement to the lecture that I'll be presenting today. Okay, so here let me first start uh, uh, the following. So, uh, the motivation for conceptual design, which is the other term used for process synthesis, is the diversification of applications, the synthesis and process intensification, the uh, shale gas production, the modular manufacturing, and the going from batch to continuous in the pharmaceutical industry. And needless to say, of course, the environmental concern toward decarbonization. And then also the concept of the circular economy. So there's a lot of uh, different problems that are arising here. And essentially here, what we want to do, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, when we talk about conceptual design, what we really want to do is identify the best process for converting raw materials into products. And of course, it could be different objectives, uh, maximizing profit, minimizing environmental impact, or maximizing social benefit. But the main goal at the end is really to find the topology, in other words, the structure of a given flow sheet. And here, uh, what has been done in the past is typically to rely on simulation tools like Aspen Tech or G prompts. But the main problem with that is that they are really meant to do simulation. So you postulate the flow sheet, you do the analysis, and then you make some changes by trial and error. What we'd like to do here is to provide for a more systematic approach for process synthesis. Now, process synthesis as an area has been around actually for quite some time, strictly speaking, it was first introduced by Professor Dale Roth and his students, Gary Powers and Jeff Zerola at the University of Wisconsin back in 1973. And basically they advocated for systematic generation of flow, process of flow sheet alternatives. And the way they pose the problem was as follows. They, they would say, we're given a, um, a inputs in the form of uh, raw materials, we have outputs of products that we want to produce. And then the main question that we want to determine here is how do we convert the raw materials into products? So jumping back and forth here. So we want to determine the phen what phenomena to exploit, what equipment do we implement, and how do we interconnect the equipment? Now, the area of process synthesis has traditionally concentrated a lot on subsystems. I'm sure you're familiar with heat exchange and network synthesis, separation systems, reactor networks, water networks, and so forth. And the main point here, these are of course important problems, but I think the main issue here is that they rely on some basic representations that explore the particular structure, and then that leads to also some specialized models, like for example, the transshipment model for heat exchange networks, the LP or MLP is just like one example. But the challenge here that we want to address is to go beyond subsistence. We want to deal with entire process flow sheets. And here, what we have to deal with are basic methodologies. These methodologies would then be translated into specialized software where we can implement you know, the synthesis of a given process flow sheet. 
Now, the sort of three major approaches in process synthesis, we have the evolutionary approach in the, on the left, in the middle hierarchical decomposition, and on the right, the superstructure optimization, which is what we're going to be discussing today. But just uh, to review very briefly, evolutionary approach, you typically start with a base case of the flow sheet, then you modify it by adding or replacing one unit at a time. But of course, that requires that the user be experienced, know what to make sense to add and so forth. And the problem here is that, of course, you're fairly limited in exploring the number of alternatives, which is sort of the key element in process synthesis. So the next approach is hierarchical decomposition. This uh, scheme is actually due to the late professor Jim Douglas, uh, who was at the University of Massachusetts. And to some extent, hierarchical decomposition was all, has also been used, for example, in other domains, like in electrical engineering, design of circuits. Idea here is that you represent at various levels, for example, a given the flow sheet, like here you, you can see, you have a flow sheet like in the case of a box, you then disaggregate it, for example, having selected the reactors, and then you make a decision on the separation. So you make sequentially designed choices at different decision levels. How do you do them? Typically, you use heuristics, and also, since you want to do a quick evaluation, you rely typically on shortcut design procedures. And here, the main problem at the end, it's kind of difficult to coordinate the decisions between the different levels to make sure that they are consistent, or at least they are optimal in the overall sense. But nevertheless, it is still, you know, I would say, a useful uh, approach, uh, uh, which on the other hand still may require an expert user or if you wish a quote expert uh, system. There's been actually some prototypes that have been developed along those lines. In the case of superstructure optimization, which is the approach that we're advocating here, we start with a given superstructure like the figure I have here on the left, and we are going to quote delete some of the units to then lead us to the actual final flow sheet structure. So the main point here is that we model the problem for simultaneous design optimization, the structure and the parameters, and we solve the corresponding model using optimization algorithms. Now here, uh, just to give you an idea from an historical perspective, what are some of the uh, evolution uh, in terms of um, approaches for superstructure optimization that have been proposed. All the way back in 72 is really kind of the first paper Omeda and co-workers that talk about the idea of the superstructure. And here on the left, you can see there was idea by the Javis Minnesotakis state space representation, motivated more like by process control. And Professor Friedler in Hungary used a p-graph using concepts of graph theory to represent the superstructure. Structure. But then there were, for example, here on the right, the STN, that's the state task network, which as we see is kind of a more natural way of representing flow sheets, but they can also be state equipment networks that perform multiple tasks or, or also, you know, uh, some other alternatives. So I'm not enumerating all of them here, but needless to say, this continues to be an area of interest, as you can see some recent work, like for example, by Professor Marvelius, and then of course, for example, there's been the work also by Professor uh, Gani, which I'm sure he will be talking to his uh, presentation using sort of the idea of phenomena building blocks. Okay, so, so there's different approaches for doing the superstructure optimization. And what I'm showing here, just in the form of figures, this would be separation of three components. This would be state as network, the first one here on, at the top on the left. On the right, this would be the state equipment network, because what we do, we postulate, for example, we know that for three components, I need two, two, and we need two distillation columns. What we're going to decide here is what tasks they perform. Do they split between A and B or between B and C in the first column and so forth? Then down here on the left is a sort of graph theory type of representation. On the left, uh, on the right here, is one who is still very much like the state task network, but using the concept of uh, ports and, and so forth. So the main point here is that it's, of course, in general, not a trivial matter to generate a superstructure of the alternatives. But once we have it, then the idea is to use a symbolic algebraic representation. We write down the model that captures, on the one hand, the physics of the process, and also the logic of the 
interconnections for the superstructure. And here, this step is also very critical because uh, how you model a problem may determine whether it's tractable or not. Now, normally what has been done is to assume uh, that you have a mixed integer nonlinear programming because it fits with the idea of having discrete continuous variables. But as we'll see, there's also the alternative of using what we call generalized disjunctive programming, which is sort of a high level logic base. But if we focus on MINOP, this is the overall problem that we have here, where you can see you have an objective function let's say minimize cost. Then you have equations that, that describe the physics uh, of the process, the reaction separations. Then you have inequalities for processes and specifications or feasibility of the operations. And the variables here, are the continuous variables X and the discrete variables are zero one variables that will determine whether or not, for example, you include a given piece of equipment. Now, once you have the problem, then you solve the mathematical problem to obtain the optimal flow sheet, and you get the topology, you get the sizes, and you obtain operating conditions. So you get the full picture of the processing steam, and you know that will then also determine as to if it's solved correctly, as to what is the optimal structure. Okay. Now, there's been some limited commercial uh, versions available for process synthesis. Most of the effort has been academic in nature, as I'm sure Professor Vanner will talk to you. He's sort of one of the few pioneers recently who's actually been developing a commercial tool for process synthesis. In our case, Pyosin is still the conservative if you wish an academic software. Okay, now, so what, what are the challenges when you develop a, you know, a synthesis uh, type of uh, tool? Well, you have the three uh, points here. Generality, how general is it? Fidelity and tractability. So here, in other words, the, you want to make sure that the superstructure will indeed include the optimal flow sheet. So how do you know that you have included all possible alternatives? That's sort of a major challenge in terms of being general. So you need for that to have systematic ways to generate the flow sheet, and I'll be describing how we do that in Pyosin. Then fidelity, you also need to make sure that you have an accurate model or at least at least different levels of complexity, but that still capture the physics and the chemical phenomena of the problem. So in here, in some cases, you may do some simplifying assumptions, but you need to make sure that these assumptions are consistent, if you wish, with the physics of the problem. And then lastly, once we have a model, we typically end up with a non-convex MINLP and the GDP, which uh, in general, not trivial to solve. And one of the issues that makes it difficult, as I'll be explaining later, is this problem of quote zero flow singularities. What it means is a unit that we postulate in the superstructure, if it does not exist, it will have zero flow, and then all kinds of numer numerical problems will take place. We will have singularities. That's the main thing that we're going to see. So the other main point I wanted to make here, of course, when you look at synthesis problems, it, when you can, of course, it's nice to solve uh, to formulate it as a mixed integer and your programming problem. However, that often is the result of approximating the problem. In some cases, like for example, say steam and power plants, that's maybe not a totally unreasonable assumption because when you fix, for example, pressures and temperatures in the head, the same basically and plan model can be indeed uh, formulated as an MLP. So it's always something maybe to keep in mind, although uh, this is definitely not the general thing that we want, especially for a general process flow sheet. Okay, now, so why do we need uh, high level modeling and optimization support? Because here we're showing sort of the typical steps uh, that you go through. So you start with a conceptual problem. Uh, so here, as we'll see, this is iterative. Once you define the problem, you look at the properties, you may have to go back and redefine what the alternatives are. Then you formulate the model, the map and the logic, you may have to go back all the way to define the structure of the problem. And then same thing, once you formulate the equations and you try to solve the problem, you may have to go back and redefine the model to make it more practical. So there's all kinds uh, in principle of uh, you know loops uh, that you can have here, which makes the uh, process for synthesizing a flow sheet to be, you know, iterative, you need to rewrite the very much, so it's very tedious. So the challenge is to try to precisely avoid this whole problem. So we need to simplify the modeling and the optimization process 
for torsion synthesis. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, pyrosin is basically a prototype that will try to attempt to address these issues. It's an automated integrated synthesis support. As you can see here on the right, it's actually part of the IDEAS project. It's Institute for Design of Advanced Energy Systems, where you just find the design problem, you, you can generate the superstructure, you can model it in different forms, and then solve the problem, you know, a, 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 in different forms as well. What I have here on the left is a diagram that shows pyrosin. The major elements here, as we will see, PSG superstructure is the port-based approach for generating the superstructure. Then we first formulate the model as a GDP, as a generalized disjunctive programming problem. But then we have the option of either solving it directly as a GDP, we have this a tool called GDP OPT, or else you can also in some cases reformulate it as an MINLP. So the idea is to give, you know, not one single option, but maybe multiple options as we'll see. And of course, this will be also supported by, for example, different type of models. It could be like circuit type of models that are data driven. You may have to rely also on external data. In some cases, it's customized. So the idea here is to provide a tool that does does allow you know for a great deal of flexibility. At least that has been sort of the vision that we've had with Pyosin and also being part of this IDS project, where there's a lot of different uh, other projects that are taking place. Now, what are the central principles? Well, first, that we want to use an intuitive high-level representation that we claim we can do with generalized disjunctive programming, which has been around in help for some time. And then we, in order to generate the superstructure. We make use of Pyoma.network, which uses the concepts of ports and arts to generate the superstructure. And we'll have a systematic way of transforming the algebraic models. We can have different reformulations, as we'll see. And the idea here, for example, we'll talk about the logic based set approximation, or it could be directly in MINOP. And then also perform like bound tightening to help to expedite the solution of, of the model. Okay, so these are some of the, it's basically being intuitive systematic and flexible. And here I'm giving some links to GitHub. So if you want to access Pyoma and also some cases that have been performed in the context of ideas. Okay, now the, the Pyosin graph representation, basically what it is, it's one where you have a unit uh, as you would do in a superstructure. You connect them with ports and the ports are then connecting the units with the streams, which are then going to give you feasible connections within the outlet and inlet. And one is interesting part here, and I'm not going to go here in great detail, but we can support also nested units. We can also support things like single choice units and reduce especially the large number of potential ports that you may have in larger superstructures. So we, we want to sort of have a clean way of transitioning into logic. So here I'm showing on the right a final superstructure that we, I claim we can obtain. If from the beginning, we just simply postulate the units and we look at all possible interconnections through the ports. So the idea then here is to use sort of a mean same type of analysis, but basically you you generate all the relevant processing alternatives, okay, by generating all possible streams, by interconnecting them. And they are based on the use of these uh, ports. Now the ports we're going to characterize by, you know, the condition of them, and that will then also give rise to subsystems. But the main two points here are to generate the processing alternatives and then to screen them out to give us, if you wish, a reduced superstructure from a high level representation. So here, the port annotations, what we'll have here, we'll have the three different types. We call the C1, that's where one you have species that are necessary to that port. Then the secondary, where species are optional to that port. For example, it may or may not exist depending on what previous step took place. But we have residual, where maybe from a practical point of view, if the concentrations are so small, we can basically disregard that port because it will not essentially contribute in any meaningful way. And it's not only the species, you can also deal with temperature. So here, very briefly, I have on the left, for example, five possible units, single choice feed, single choice reactor, flash, 
the product and the perk. And you can see, for example, single choice feed, the atlas is support, a, a black dot that then feeds into the process. Then we have single choice reactor. The inlets are the white ports. The outlets are the black ports that are shown here, like the flash, we have white port coming in, the two black ports coming out and so forth. So then what we do here simply for each unit, we then uh, you know, assign the name to it. We then specify what is the task. And then here, what we do for the different ports, we basically indicate to what units do they belong to? Are they input or output? What components or species do they involve? And also can specify, for example, temperature levels, okay? And we can also specify, for example, when some of these are not going to be relevant, okay? So then having this logic, what uh, uh, my student Xi has done is to develop sort of a rule-based procedure, sequential, where applying these rules, you can then screen out what are the feasible interconnections? So for example, rule one will be based on port feasibility, which is uh, here on the right, I have sort of symbolic expressions in terms of um, uh, set theory. I'm not going to go into that level of detail. I uh, just want to convey here that there is a way of systematically applying these rules for uh, feasibility, satisfiability, looking at useful reactions, useful separation, using at useful inlets connections if you satisfy this condition for the subset being involved in this superset, or looking at type compatibility, okay? Again, this is fairly detailed. That's why I don't want to spend too much time over it, but just simply to tell you that there, that, that will lead to an automated way of generating the superstructure. So here is just a simple example where we have heat reaction, flash liquid, flash vapor. So in principle, you can have all possible interconnections, but basically by applying the various rules that I outlined before, for example, here, as we see, rule five actually eliminates uh, right away four 44% of the undesirable streams that are simply not needed. So in other words, you don't need a lot of the potential streams based on the grants, again, on what components they have and, and, and what is the task that, for example, the units will perform. And then here, again, the, the way the uh, uh, condition is performed is through mean sand analysis, where again, here, as you can see, we enumerate the uh, ports, and then we also specify the conditioning that is needed. The, the bottom line here, once you apply this procedure, this is the output that you get. You get the output, the superstructure, which as you can see here, for the feed, you have two options, a cheap or expensive feedstock. Then that goes to a single or two-stage compression. Then you can have heating or cooling. Then the reactor, a lower conversion, cheaper, a more expensive, higher conversion. And then you have the separation that gives you the product and gives you also the perch and the other one gives the, uh, the stream for the recycle, for which you can have also single and two stage. The main point here is that, of course, actually in the past, we typically would take a problem and tr ourselves translate that superstructure into a diagram like this one. The beauty with Pyosa, with what uh, she, uh, she has done, is that this superstructure is being uh, generated automatically simply by describing what are the units, what are the different options we want to consider, and what are, again, the different qualifications that apply for the species and the temperatures and other items, okay? So then the key ideas in here is to have a automated way of generating the superstructure. We can support nested units to simplify larger superstructure. There's also sometimes the so-called single choice units where it's one or the other. So that logic you know, is also translated here, then uh, translated uh, later to the GDP problem. And again, we then have sort of a novel systematic way of generating the superstructure. Again, there are other approaches and I'm sure also Professor Gani will talk about some of that because uh, some of this uh, work has uh, actually also addressed precisely this type of problem. Now, once we have the superstructure, we now want to model, we want to solve it. And here, again, as I indicated before, the traditional way is in my NLP. You have your continuous variables x, your discrete variables y, the objective and your constraints. But what we want to do here, we want to model it as a generalized disjunctive programming problem. Here we're giving some basic references if you're not familiar with that uh, type of approach. And the motivation here is a, a more intuitive way rather than forcing the user to write down directly equations and constraints. So essentially what you do here, you have again the objective, you have constraints, 
that do not depend on any uh, discrete decisions. The discrete decisions are captured in two ways. You have a junction where you say, if it exists, then you apply the set of equations of a given cost. If it does not exist, then basically the subset of the variables take a value of zero because it doesn't exist. And then, so that's a disjunction, it's like an if then else type of construct. And then what we then have is the propositional logic. So here, the Boolean variables that we introduce in the problem, because here notice we're using uh, Boolean variables that are true or false, we don't use zero one for Boolean variable, we can write down propositional logic statements. Like for example, we can say choosing one or two implies some of these conditions. We would say why one or why two implies that you do y three and you do not do y four, and it's either five or six. So it's a very complex logic. It's not, a, for example, totally trivial to write that as an equation. The advantage here we can express that as a high level logic statement. That's basically the idea behind GDP. And just to give you some specific example, first, this is a GDP problem of a single column where we want to determine the number of trays. So the permanent trays is a condenser at the top, the one in the middle is the feed tray, and at the bottom, the reporter. So what we have in between the permanent trays are conditional trays that may or may not exist. So the way we write the model here for the permanent and conditional trays, we write the mesh equation, material energy and sum and enthalpy equations. And then also for the in non-existing potential trays, we write the mass and energy balances, but for the conditional trays, for the ones that may or may not exist in the solution, we're going to state that if it's true that the tray exists, we're going to apply vapor liquid equilibrium constraints. If it's not, then we just disregard it. It's going to act sort of like a bypass where nothing is happening. So that's one way you can model the selection of trays in a distillation column with GDP. Now, let me show you maybe a more a conventional type of example for a process flow sheet. Here we use what is called the state task network. So here we have, for example, the feed, single two stage, the two possible reactors. And we have the, in this case, first the flash unit that's followed by a distillation column where we obtain the main product and here from the flash this also gets back uh, recycled to, to the feed. The, the main point here as you can see when we model this problem we have you know equations that apply for you know things that you know are fixed you know like for example here say the cooler or uh, the units of that sort and then for the units that are conditional where you have conditional tasks what we do we say if you do select for example this reactor, you apply these equations, but if you do not select that reactor, you just simply set the subset of the variables to zero. You basically ignore them. Okay, so this is the formulation of the state task network. And again, the key thing here is using the Boolean variables to indicate whether or not an equipment is selected. Now, there's an alternative, the SCN, this means state equipment network. So here what we do in this superstructure, we assume that the equipment can perform multiple tasks. So for example, the reactor here may perform different uh, reactions. Same thing, we have heater and cooler, depends on how they are going to be interconnected. So the, these are more complex uh, structures. I showed before the ones for separation, where we said A, B, and C, and I only have two columns. I know I need two columns, but I need to decide what tasks will they perform? So here, the way again, when you write down the GDP model for the uh, uh, ones that are single tasks, you use a simple disjunction as we saw before, where you have like choice of different units. But then when you have, for example, conditional equipment that may or may not exist, you may have even what we call embedded disjunction. So if UJ is true, you are going to select that equipment, but selecting that equipment is going to be an or statement on what task that equipment is is going to be performed. So it's a very nice, rich way of expressing a problem that avoids a problem of the user having to go and write down the equations. Okay, so the key ideas here is we have a high level logic based representation. We can preserve the problem structure. And then also we can extend the model principles to address model management and maintenance, as was done in the case of Pios and by my student. And you can also, and this is an important thing, this is not the 
single rigid way of solving the problem. So once you have the GDP, there's different options as we'll see in a moment on how you can approach them. So here, what are the issues uh, with uh, parallelism and logical modeling? Well, again, we want to avoid the issue of zero flow singularities. That's a big, big problem in superstructure optimization for nonlinear system. In that case, the GDP, the logic base is a nice way of avoiding that uh, problem. We have this um, system, the GDP OPT, it's a solver implementation. And Paramo GDP is the one that is basically the system that is actually implemented in the uh, part of the Paramo system. Okay, if you go to the um, uh, GitHub, you can find information about that. Let me show you here a very, with a very simple, trivial example, why this issue of zero flow. So let's say I have a feed, I have two possible reactors, one and two. So here I have the feed uh, coming with A, B, and C. Then I want to minimize for example, the amount of raw material A I require. I have the equations for the splitter, which simple algebraic equations, and then for the split fractions, the equations for the mixer, which is again simple algebraic equations. And then I have the equations for the conversion. Well, now here what happens is uh, we have it sort of for reactor one and for reactor two. Now let us assume here that we use only reactor two. So reactor one is going to be deleted, so to speak from the superstructure. What that will mean is that actually the flows going into reactor one will be zero. And that means if you want to define composition, you get a zero divided by zero. And that's going to lead obviously to singularity. And typically what will happen, have, happen here, you use an NLP solver, you, no matter which one it is, your favorite, whether it's IP opt, con opt or whatever, it's simply not going to converge. And it's going to be precisely because of this problem that we are creating a situation that is undesirable. Now, one simple approach you might say, well, because this is undefined, what if I use a small value, like a small epsilon? In principle, yes, you could do that, but again, it's going to be one that also leads to ill conditioning, especially of the derivatives, as I'm showing here, when the derivative of x with f, you know, it's a fairly large value. So it will lead to ill conditions. So we want to avoid this problem in the first place. And that is precisely what we can avoid with the GDP model. So here, uh, the, the basic algorithm, as we'll see, is a logic-based outer approximation. And it uses basically a, a, an outer approximation, but based on logic, as we'll see. And the key concept is we'll work with a reduced space. So here, as you'll see, the GDP will generate a linear model that will then give rise to an MILP. Okay, and I'll show you in a second more detailed steps, but once you have the, the several sub-problems for the master, then you solve a reduced NLP problem. You don't need to solve the full space problem as we saw in that little example. So let's say here on the right, I have this GDP model. So what's going to happen here, if you write it as an MINLP, for example, if constraint one does not apply, somehow you convert it into big M constraint and the flow here is going to go to zero, it's going to be a problem. In the case of the GDP, what we do, we just simply eliminate that constraint G1. It's simply not going to be there in the first place. Okay, so we solve basically a reduced problem, which then increases the robustness of the formulation. So it avoids the, uh, the computation of a constraint of a unit that is not selected and we avoid especially this big problem of zero flows. And moreover, we also then work the NLP in a reduced space. We don't work in the large original space of the superstructure. So we work on the structure of the particular topology that is actually being analyzed. Here I have a, sort of a, um, a, an extension just to show you in some more detail how the logic-based algorithm works. It was actually developed by Metin Turkai as part of his uh, PhD thesis at Carnegie Mellon. So what you start here, we start with several initial NLPs to cover, so to speak, all the units in the flow sheet. It's technically actually the set covering problem. Solving that NLP, you then generate a master problem, and then that master problem, which is an MLP, will then select the discrete variables, which then in turn will tell you which are the disjunctions, uh, which of the terms of the disjunctions are actually being activated, and that will then give you a reduced NLP, the NLP of A 
specific flow sheet. So you end up solving a smaller reduced NLP. And then, of course, you keep it trading until, you know, the bounds from the NLP and the MLP, for example, lie within some tolerance. The other thing that is very interesting here, I should say, because we solve the true, the NLP of a specific flow sheet, the approximations we get in the master problem tend to be actually very good, even though there's supposedly no mathematical guarantee that that should be the case. But the answer is very simple. We avoid this issue of zero flows. That's the main message here, okay? Now, the other important thing when we deal with disjunctive problems, we can also come up with disjunctive bounds. That would be especially useful if you do a global optimization. I have here a very simple example, minimize this function, then you have a disjunction. If x is greater or equal than one, then z is greater or equal than the log, or else z is equal to two, and x is bounded between these values. So here, if you, what you want to do, for example, typically if you do like a global optimization is to linearize that function, obtain an underestimator, and that's going to rely on your bounds. And this is basically the way they, we would view the underestimation of the log function. Now, what is the problem here? Mathematically is correct. We are indeed underestimating that concave function, but here, and this is the important part in terms of the implementation of the software, we do recognize that we have a bound in the disjunction. So actually, we can actually obtain a tighter, if you wish, low bound, as is seen, seen here, because we determine the secant not over the entire domain, but the secant for x greater equal than one up to its upper bound. And therefore, we gain now a much tighter lower bound, especially when we do a global optimization. Baron is typically the uh, software that we use here. And again, this is uh, something that has also been implemented automatically to try to come up with tighter bounds. And this is especially meaningful. It also, by the way, increases the robustness of the NLP problem. Okay, so the idea then here again is to provide for flexible solution strategies. So here we start with, again with a GDP model. Then here we're going to, going to have the option of either using a reformulation and convert it into an MINLP. You could use the big M, the whole relaxation, or maybe it's using some cutting planes, or else we could do the disjunctive, we may perform something called basic steps and solve it as a GDP problem. So we want to provide that flexibility. So it's not one single approach. Now, the standard way, which the one I'm showing here, if it's MINLP, you could do the big M reformulation. Those of you, if you're not familiar with that in the um, references that I gave, we show big M is like the more intuitive type of approach. Whole reformulation, you disaggregate the verb because you have a high dimensional representation. And you can see here some part of the code that has been done in Permic where it can automatically perform actually that uh, transformation. Now, transformation between big M and convex hull, if I have this disjunction A or B or C, basically what it means if you have the big M, you develop, if you wish, a rectangle approximation that contains the feasible sets of the disjunction. And uh, the, uh, the problem is that the continuous relaxation here can often be weak. It's not always the case, but it can be fairly weak. On the other hand, if we do the whole relaxation, which is the one I have here on the right, we can get a much tighter relaxation. And I would say this is especially useful if you're interested in doing global optimization because balance is everything there. But keep in mind, it's not the case that always whole reformulation wins. There are cases where big M re requires fewer variables, fewer constraints, might give you relaxation that is also comparable. And that's why it's so important to have the option of uh, looking at both, okay? So then here, what we're showing is once you do one or the other, you then resolve to an MINLP solver. MintPy is actually a solver we developed in our group by David Pernell. And then there's also, for example, interface to commercial solvers through the system. This is done via GAMS, where you can access basically all the other the MINLP solvers, where they are global, like Baron, Skip, or for example, SVP, Antigone, and, and so forth. Okay, so that's on uh, by translation via GAMS. Okay, the other approach is to do directly the GDP. So from the GDP model, the solvers GDP OPT. Okay, and here we have implemented three basic approaches the logic based approximation, which is the one I described before. 
the global logic base, which is a global version that makes use, especially in McCormick envelopes, uh, you know, to underestimate the uh, rigorous data functions. And then we also have actually a disjunctive branch and back. This is more recent, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but just keep in mind, it's basically logic based or approximation that's going to be the useful and whether the local or the global version. And here what we're showing, this is a set of 33 uh, problems with a limit of one hour and within 1% of the best known solutions. So we're plotting time versus the instances that were solved. The blue, this would be, you know, theoretically the best one. And you can see the logic based approximation, the green one is the one that actually performs uh, the best here. Compared, for example, Byron uh, in this case is, for example, the orange uh, at the end, you know, if you give it enough time, then of course it will find the solution. And there's also the other solvers like skip or DACA. DACA in this case actually does not perform that well because it's actually kind of a local solver. But having said that, there are problems where DACA also perform actually fairly well. But this is just to give you a little bit of a feel. The important message here, there's not a single solver that will treat all the problems uniformly effectively. So here, let me present you some examples. This is a nine process uh, problem. We have this uh, simple superstructure. We have input output relationships. We have 18 binary variables, eight, 19 continuous, eight nonlinear constraints. And basically here, this is the optimal solution to the problem. So we select processes one, three, and eight out of the other units that have been eliminated. If you try to solve this problem as an NINOP, you will not get any feasible solution because of this issue of zero flows, because we have nonlinear relations of inputs and outputs, and that would basically cause us a problem. With a global logic based approximation, we can solve this to global optimality in 19 seconds, okay, to request global optimality. Now, of course, this is still kind of a toy type of problem. So we also, of course, you know, have looked at, uh, you know, other applications. But before I go into that, just to again uh, summarize that the key ideas in Pyomo GDP and GDP OPT is to give you an intuitive modeling scheme. Okay, it is a modern implementation of uh, logic based, global logic based sort of automation. And I think, especially the issue of the bounds, the disjunctive bounds has proved to be really quite effective, especially for global optimization. And here, by the way, this is a quote from Francisco Tres Palacios, who was a PhD student who was before Xi Chen had, for example, the statement in this uh, thesis saying that CAM, CMP, and Prioma currently support GDP mainly for reformation, but they're not very intuitive. And very fortunately, since the uh, thesis of Francisco Tres Palacios, we now have through Pyosin and through the GDP uh, OPT solver, a very nice systematic way that can support the, these reformulations. Okay, let me just finish with a couple of examples uh, that might be of interest to show an example on modular process design. As you know, uh, the idea is that uh, when you have modular approach, you get the so-called economy of mass production, because as you, you standardize the units, it becomes in that sense, eventually cheaper. And it's also for transportation of the modules, uh, they, they, they have uh, the flexibility, you can, it's sort of a, a numbering up type of uh, approach that you use rather than coming up with specific sizes of a given flow sheet. So where the problem that we looked at here was again, trying to look at conceptual design modular versus conventional. Here we looked at this from a high level point of view. So the main point here, when you have modular design is that by and large, your NLP tends to become an MILP. And why? For the very simple reason, for example, if you take the cost function of summation alpha size to the 0.6 and size is continuous, this is nonlinear, it's concave function. But if you have the sweet sizes, if you discretize, you can actually rewrite this as a constant times a binary variable, and you select, for example, only one of the sizes. You basically have kind of linearized. So basically, interestingly enough, modular design problems in that sense make the problem somewhat easier to solve because they induce the linearity into the problem. So here we had first like a simple um, a market capacity expansion problem where you want to optimize the capacity, well, the, the term capacity to maximize profit. And the point here, if you 
you have like your conventional plan, so for example, let's say here, we're plotting the demand versus time. If you use a single conventional plan, you initially start work, uh, you know, uh, working over capacity, then you reach kind of the limit, and at the end, you're performing on the capacity. The nice thing with modular design, you can track more easily, as you can see here, because you don't need to commit from the very beginning to larger capacity. And still, of course, at the end, you may still miss some of the final demand. But the main point here, it gives you a way of tracking more closely the uh, changes in the demand. So it gives faster time to market and allows for greater flexibility, okay? And for this uh, uh, very simple problem, we found out here that, for example, we could obtain higher profit if we did the modular design, even though, even though the construction cost is higher because you need, you do not take advantage of the economies of scale. Okay, but as we'll see, let me give you a more a complex problem, multiple market expansion. So we have these five customer locations, the scores are customer locations. And here, these are the different market demands that, you know, change with time. And we want to decide here, you know, uh, where do we uh, place the facilities and do we do, uh, you know, centralize the type of uh, conventional type of capacity or do we go modular? Okay. And basically, we also allow for the relocation of modules. So, for example, you may start with a module at a given site that may be moved to some other place. Okay. So, here, what I'm showing is the conventional solution when you have a centralized uh, uh, facility, it's a conventional plan. And here, as you can see in blue, you, you get the initial capacity and you work on this. And this gives you actually a total cost of 48.4 million. Okay, so it's a single plan that is then distributing the product to these five different sites. Now, in the case where we do the possibility of having modular design, we actually end up here with uh, essentially, as you can see, the two circles with two modular plants. But as you can see, what's interesting here, which you look at how adding the modules actually allows you to uh, track closer the changes in the demand. And basically the bottom line here, if you compare the conventional versus the modular, you find out here that, uh, as you might expect, the total um, cost that is incurred in modular is actually smaller because although, yes, you. you the construction cost is higher, the transportation cost is much, much lower because now you, you don't need to, from a single location, distribute to your five different sites of product. Now, of course, that may change with the data, but again, it's just a, an example. This is a high level type of example of a synthesis type of uh, problem. Now, we've also looked, of course, to quite a few uh, case studies. We have the uh, conventional A process problem. We have waste charge, uh, the reduction, cable column, methane to synthesis, sink gas. So I'm just going to run very quickly here through some of these applications. So the same gas process uh, it was actually provided to us by Professor Jose Caballero from University of Alicante in Spain. And basically here where you have a sort of a sequence of steps to produce the same gas product for which you can have different alternatives. In this case, it turns out we formulate the problem as a GDP. And one of the options here is in fact converted into an MINLP. The reason is because of the structure of the equations here. We don't run into this problem of zero flow so we can solve it with whole relaxation or with big M, you can see in this case, big M actually solves faster because although it's not as tight, you don't require to disaggregate so many verticals. So, so the fact that you have a tighter bound does not necessarily mean it's going to be fast. And this is like one example. So here we solve this problem with M and LP using the uh, big M formulation. But now this is an example from uh, Soraya Rawlings looking at cable columns. And the idea here, say you have these four components, methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol, these four products here. The traditional way would be to use three columns, for example, this given sequence. And what you want to do here, you want to perform the separations into a single column that I'm showing here. So where you have basically four products coming out at the top A, D at the bottom and B and C in, in the middle. So the way uh, this model was uh, formulated, again, this is a court intensified uh, column. And again, here the uh, objective was to minimize capital and operating uh, costs. 
the major decisions here was the number of trays. So what I showed you before on the junctions for the trays is precisely what we use here to model the problem. And of course, we had to rely on uh, the mesh equations that I also indicated before. But my main point here is that this problem was actually formulated as a GDP uh, problem. And here I'm just giving you on the one hand, how the superstructure to which was generated using this procedure of uh, screening through the ports. Okay, and that then gives you this uh, structure here. And again, we use for the um, a possible existence or not of equipment that the junction I had indicated before. And this is actually the optimal solution that we obtained. What's interesting here is that if we were to do exhaustive enumeration, there's actually 42 million possible configurations. Why? because it's not only number of trays, not, uh, also remember here, so we, we have like a divided wall. So we have trays on one side, trays on the other side. Then we also have to decide the feed tray. We have to decide where we extract the feed. So again, it can be a huge number of combinations. So this problem we were able to actually solve with a logic based on approximation, let's say over 600 seconds, about 10 minutes, it took actually four iterations to find the solutions. And here we're sh uh, showing you the specific profile for liquid uh, compositions on both uh, sides. And basically here, the result in the side actually gave a 21% a reduction in terms of uh, number of traces, especially if you use a simple Fenske underwood type of uh, approach. So here we're using a rigorous uh, model. We have the dividing uh, wall between the 12th and 26th tray. And so for the bottom line here, this gave a significantly cheaper design versus doing, if you wish, a conventional design that was almost twice as expensive. So again, this is a very nice example that illustrates the power of process intensification, but then also with the idea that we can use this chunk of programming for doing this. And this again was done through PyOson. Okay. So the key contribution through uh, PyOson is that it has broad applicability. I think it has uh, hopefully shown there is flexibility of different representations. We can go from GDP to MINLP. It's not a single track approach. Okay, so you can have the option of exploring different approaches. It's also, I would say, quite general because it uses fundamental uh, criteria for different fundamental phenomena uh, for the for the units. And I think also what is very important here, the problems become much more trackable because of the fact that through the logic and GDP, we're exploiting the structure. And especially the one thing I hope that uh, you know goes back to you as a major message is the fact that you will avoid this whole problem of zero flows because a lot of the problems uh, when when you come back and remember first applications that did for MINOP, I found that our solver that could, could not solve, but it was precisely because we had this issue of zero flows and the GDP formulation formalism avoids that problem. So I hope that with those examples that are presented, you know, that gives you an idea what is possible with Pyosin. So remember the uh, references I did give you at the beginning. So those are ones that you can basically, uh, you know, uh, refer to from the material I presented here. I'd be happy also to send the slides if you if you need some more. And I think with this, uh, I'd like to thank your attention. And let me see, I think I'm just going to stop the share and I need to then stop also the recording. So thank you very much for your attention and it was a pleasure giving you this lecture. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, now, <clears throat> Dr. Bernal, are you there? Yeah, hi, how are you? Uh, okay. Sorry, I, was, I wasn't able to unmute myself. Um, okay. First of all, thank you so much, Professor Gani, for letting me answer some questions here. I'm currently in the in the airport in Pittsburgh, so it might be a little bit loud on my end. Please let me know if you're not able to hear me. Okay, fine. Are you able to look at the questions on chat or maybe Oracle can read it for you? Um, I am currently looking at the chat in the Zoom meeting, but apparently I, I cannot see any, any questions. So if you don't mind reading them out loud for me, I would really appreciate it. Okay. okay, I did see some questions. Ora coach? Yes. 
Okay, for for the first questions, is there a difference between Frochis and superstructures? Um, sure, sure. Um, let's see. There, there is certainly a, a, a conceptual difference between flow sheets and superstructures. I would say the short answer to that question is you uh, include in a superstructure all the potential flow sheets that can represent your process, right? So in a superstructure, you will include uh, all the potential units that you would like to include all that all those potential interconnections and once you have this very general uh way of summarizing all the different possibilities that you have that's where you need to plug in an optimization algorithm to help you realize among all the possible flow sheets and and interconnections and units that you can use which ones are the ones better fit for your objective function. So yeah, that's the main difference between those two. Okay. The second one is how to balance between the simplicity of physical or chemical phenomena in the unit operation to model and the complexity of the problem to solve. So yeah, uh, let, let me try to break down that question a little bit. So certainly, uh, physical and chemical phenomena and their mathematical modeling leads to certain, how to explain this, uh, mathematical expressions that are hard to, that are hard to optimize over. Uh, in technical terms, for those of you uh, familiar with optimization, they usually yield not only nonlinear, but non-convex um, relationships, which are really hard for optimization hardware. Uh, hardware and software. So the, to the question on how to use those into unit operations and help your optimization solver, I think that um, certainly you can also come up with simpler models. And by simpler, I mean with mathematical expressions that make the solution through optimization algorithms easier. Uh, with the trade-off that you're sacrificing a little bit of the of the of the exactness and and how precise these models are, and and uh, so yeah, I mean you need to live with that trade-off. I think that one of the examples that Professor Grossman was showing uh, with one of uh, Dr. Chen's previous work that had to do between choosing different levels of uh, detail on each unit operation to see, uh, to just use whichever uh, makes sense at that stage of the solution process. I think that that's a good approach to tackle this. I don't know if I correctly answered the question. So please let me know if I, if, if there is still something a little bit unclear. Okay, um, so for the fun, if you have any additional question, can send us through the chat. And we'll go to the next questions. Is it possible to include uncertainty analysis in the superstructure optimizations? If yes, how? So uh, short answer, yes, absolutely, right? The fact that you are in a sense through this biosyn, you are modeling your process optimization as any optimization problem and therefore you can attach uncertainty into the variables into into the parameters into something that people in the optimization community know as stochastic programming so that is certainly possible right uh, now the the how to do so it's it's the harder question to answer um, fortunately the tools in Pyosin, they have been implemented in uh, Python uh, over some software called Pyomo, which is an algebraic modeling, uh, modeling language. This algebraic modeling language, fortunately, also gives uh, plugins to a stochastic programming or uncertainty uh, optimization tools, so you can definitely connect the two of them. I uh, would like to refer you to the works of Dr. Yishin 
uh, Yen, and uh, who actually implemented this uh, superstructure optimization with uncertainty quantification. So it's certainly possible. And through the tools that have been developed here is uh, a little bit easier than, than what the general idea tends to say. Okay. Um, There's one last question. Yeah. Is, 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 is it the question from the chat from Maria Ona Bertrand? Yes, yes. Sure. So, and let me just read it out loud for everyone. So what are your opinions, the main challenges for application of such methods and tools in industry and how to address them? Okay, well, this is, this is a rather deep question. So, um, I would say that fortunately the, the chemical industry has been one of those that has been prone to adopt many of these optimization based techniques. Um, so you can see basically the, the, the energy sectors, the petrochemical industry, they heavily rely on many of these techniques in order to uh, design and operate uh, their processes. So I think that there is, uh, um, at least there is a drive in there. Certainly there are many technical challenges to that end. Uh, in particular, how are these tools going to be used uh, by, the different, by the different teams? And, and I would like to bring your attention, the project that funded these, uh, the, the development of Piosin and that actually funded part of my PhD program is the IDEAS project. So it's the Institute for the Development of Advanced Energy Systems. This was a collaborative effort with industry and, and academia in order to um, try to tackle these challenges that we have in implementing these advanced tools, which certainly papers have shown that can lead to, to improvements into actual industrial uses. So I would say it's not a matter, uh, I think the technology is there. I think that the techniques have been developed at this point. I think that the main challenge is more on a technical side on how to bring these tools forward to industry to easily adapt them. I think, again, one, one good step forward is what you have just seen on Piosin by the, the choice of having this software being open source, open access with free uh, access to any industrial uh, user that wants to use it within, within them and the licenses allow for that. I think it's a, it's a good step forward on uh, sort of reducing the, the activation energy to, for this technology to be adopted. So I, I, I think that that's, that's a very long and vague answer to your question, but I, I think that it sort of hits the nail where in the case of what is the major challenge is, is just easiness to adopt in industry. I, I, I don't know if time allows, I see that there is another question um, we'll take, we we'll take that question and then we can Absolutely. finish. Absolutely. So the, the question is from Kosen Ra. And the question is, are there any specific target user of target users of Piosin? And the answer is yes. Uh, I would say that anyone involved in, in, in process development um, should and with and that's that's the, the, the target user, right? Someone we try to make this kind of tools as easily approachable such that you don't need a PhD in optimization in order to, in order to use these tools and you can focus on, we, we should uh, provide tools such that people spend their time doing what they do well. So if you really know how your process works, if you have a very detailed model of, of however process you're designing, um, then that should be uh, you are the target user, right? You shouldn't be you shouldn't be aware of what happens underneath the hood because 
then we uh, take care of the, of the optimization side of it. And then you just go into formulating your superstructure model using the algorithms that we put, uh, uh, that we made available for you. And hopefully it will give you an, an answer that is satisfactory. So that's the part of user. And just a, a, a short question. Have you seen Pyosin being used in, in industrial symbiosis implementation? Um, there is this nice example from the IDEAS team where they went ahead and collaborated with a power plant uh, located, in, located in Pittsburgh. What I, what I will do is maybe I can just drop in the chat uh, a link to the IDEAS project and then you will see some of the, um, some of the, the results and what has been done so far. So uh, that's the link over there. And I guess that after that, you can, you can just go ahead. Obviously, Pyosin is, is just a small, it's just one part. It's not a small part, actually, of this, uh, of this project. It's actually one of the, of the key, uh, um, yeah, features of this, of this project, but there is much more and, and I would certainly would like to invite you to, to go look it up. And if you're interested and excited about all the stuff that is in there, there you can always uh, reach out to the people. Uh, to, we're always looking for, for collaborators. So feel free to reach out to them, to us actually. And, uh, and we'll be more than happy to, to hear your experiences. I, I okay. see that somebody is raising their hand, uh, Professor is Daniel. Daniel, yes. Daniel has raised hand. Yes. Okay. Um, video allowed. Da Daniel, you can speak now. Okay. This oh, will yes. be the last question. Yes. Good morning, uh, Professor Bernal. I would like to ask you if you have performed some sensitivity analysis about the models, I mean, in, in the methods that are available in, in the libraries of Python for performing the optimization, or you have used a tailor-made routine for solving this optimization problem. If you have used some of the packages already included with Python for optimization, and which one is the most recommendable? So um, short answer, both. Uh, the, we are using Python packages. We rely heavily in this uh, package called PyOMO, which is, as I said, uh, the interface between Python and the optimization solvers. That package itself relies on other libraries to perform optimization. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but we, you can access Cplex and Groovy. Uh, and Baron and IPOPT and all these kind of highly optimized libraries for performing optimization. Having said that though, uh, some of the algorithms particularly tailored for superstructure optimization and disjunctive programming, we had them implemented ourselves, right? And that's the whole GDP opt part of the, of the implementation that, that we were saying uh, that we were saying earlier. So um, yeah, sh long story short, both, uh, wherever we could find a good package that could be act easily accessed and, and that it would take us longer to write ourselves than to ju just use it and the, and the licenses are, are amenable with that end goal that we have, we go for it. We heavily rely on Pyomo. And then on top of that, if there is some stuff that is missing, then we just implemented it ourselves. I hope that that answered the, the questions. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, shall we move to another session? Okay, so thank you. Thank you everyone. Dr. Bernal, thank you very much. Thank you. And also thank you to Professor Grossman for sending a very, very nice recorded lecture. So I look forward to seeing a lot more from you and Professor Grossman's group on this process synthesis area with Pyramo. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, 
I will go to the next part.